Uh, okay, so um, I'll pause the recording when the uh, Q&A session starts. Okay, so, oh, welcome. We have 200 people, maybe more. Yeah, more. Well, people are keep coming. That's awesome. Okay. Um, sorry, sometimes I might be looking at the two screens, but I have two screens. So one small one has a camera and the other big one uh, does not. So if I look the other way, just a second, I am uh, I have to try to, okay. Okay. So um, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us at our session, Information Has a Value, a Marxist Approach. My name is Ping C2. I am the moderator for today's session. I am a liaison librarian here at the University of Arizona Libraries, um, working with a number of departments of the College of Humanities here uh, of, of the University of Arizona working with uh, those such as East Asian studies, uh, Spanish and Portuguese, French and Italian, Africana studies, etc. cetera. Uh, our per, uh, speaker of the presentation is Dave Allenworth from Seattle Central College. Dave will introduce himself before his presentation. There will be about 15 minutes of Q&A slash discussion session after the pre presentation. Uh, for your convenience, I already uh, included the, the symposium schedule in the Zoom chat, as well as uh, an email in case you have any questions for us. Um, I will also be monitoring the Zoom chat throughout the session. So please use the Zoom chat if you have any questions or comments. So without further ado, let's join me in welcoming our speaker, Dave Allenworth. Dave, is your, your floor. Right. <laughs> Well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen just to get my my PowerPoint. Oh, that's not. Yeah. It, oh, this is not okay. This is not the PowerPoint, but oh. Oh yeah, this is screenshot. Stop share. That's weird. Let's see here, there it is. Okay. Can everyone see that? can you see that yes okay awesome thank you all right so hello everyone and welcome to information has value a marxist approach again as ping mentioned my name is dave ellenwood and i'm a librarian at seattle central college um, in washington state and i want i first want to just thank the the claps uh, organizing committee for uh, persevering through COVID and making this um, this conference available online. Uh, I think the work that you all have done is so impressive. And also thank you to Ping for moderating this session. Um, I just really appreciate uh, your liaisoning with me, liaising. Um, and okay, so let's look at the goals. Um, first of all, I did not expect so many people and that's just so amazing. Um, shows where my ego is. I, I was thinking like 15 to 30 people would show up. It'd be a cozy thing, but okay, let's do this. Um, so the goals of our session are to explore a basic Marxist understanding of capitalism, including value, uh, labor and information markets, and to share my approach to critically teaching and organizing around Marxist information literacy. Uh, so just some lo logistics real quick. Um, so when I originally planned to present this at CLAPS, I was going to try to put a lot more content into it. And I think with Zoom, things just go a little slower. Um, so I'm gonna scale it back somewhat and I'm trying to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, and then leave time for questions at the end as, as Ping mentioned earlier. Um, there is a more detailed discussion of, of these arguments that I just published in, um, in, uh, in the library with the lead pipe. And I'm gonna link to that in the chat right now in case folks wanna go check that out to, to kind of read more in depth into the arguments. Okay. So I first want to uh, start out with some acknowledgements, which is, not always the way things go, but um, because this project and these ideas are collective 
and I don't want them to all be uh, associated with me or attributed to me. So I've, um, when I first started kind of thinking through some of this framework, I was at UW Buffalo and Cascadia College and um, office, uh, next door office mates with Caitlin Maxwell. And she, you know, we, I would go bother her and talk about some of these issues. And she was really helpful and instrumental in kind of kicking uh, some of these ideas off several years ago. And then when I moved to um, Seattle Central, uh, my office mate there, Katie Dichter, was a really good, is a really good um, partner in thinking about these ideas. And then Lynn Caney, my dean, Sharon Spence Wilcox, uh, both on my tenure committee, who have helped me think through this. And also uh, Kimberly Tate Malone was also instrumental in that. Um, and then in terms of the writing, the, the article I just shared, um, I got a lot of help in the process from uh, Romel Espinel, Ian Balin, uh, and Ryan Randall. Uh, Romel and Ian did formal reviews of the, of the work and, uh, and Ryan provided the uh, editorial work. And he, he's, I think, in the audience. So, uh, hey, Ryan, thanks for being here. And then uh, early on in the process, I uh, had some, some uh, reading help from Christian Anderson, Emily Drabinsky, uh, my partner, Becca Meredith, uh, my brother, Ben Ellenwood, and the scholar, Vincent Mosco and all their feedback was so invaluable. You know, I'll take all the, the uh, this was a collective project, but I synthesized it, so any problems uh, should not be blamed on them. Okay, so the problems that we face right now are significant and scary, right? And I think that's kind of obvious. It's uh, beating us over the head with the problems that we have. So at the societal level, we are, have, we are experiencing multiple economic crashes in the last uh, decade or so. Um, we're experiencing impending climate change. And literally right now, I'm breathing through the smoke in the Seattle area that is created by, um, by climate change partially, uh, from fires created by climate change. Um, COVID is uh, a global pandemic and we're all experiencing that right and it's impacting our ability to work um, it's impacting our ability to move around and um, socialize and be connected with people another major problem and then I also wanted to mention the anti-black police violence that is so in our psyche currently this has been going on for generations uh, centuries um, but it's currently uh, in our, it's currently more in our psyche because of the, the filming and circulation of these horrific events online. Um, all, of these, all of these problems at the societal level have you know, an economic component to them that we uh, should consider. And then problems that are more specific to libraries. Um, we all know that our vendors are gouging us with their high uh, costs and students experiencing paywalls, right? And at the same time, uh, vendors are making record, record profits, right? So um, you all might know that Elsevier made uh, $4 billion in profits in, in uh, 2018. And uh, that, was, that was about 31% profit, which is really unheard of um, in terms of profit numbers. Okay, so these are our problems. There's nothing, you know, uh, insignificant about these. These are really serious problems that we're dealing with. Um, but what can we do as teaching librarians, which I'm, you know, kind of assuming most of us are in this space? Um, what can we do about these problems? It often feels like we have very little power, and I've felt that sort of inadequacy in my time as a librarian. And um, you know, the first immediate answer is that you know, luckily we are teachers, and I think teaching is one way that we can make an intervention into. Um, into some of these problems. Okay, so the value frame, uh, the information has value frame. So our, our um, previous frame, our previous standard had limitations, right? The standard shied away from critical analysis of information structures and simply demanded that we act ethically and legally within existing information structures. But the value frame takes us in this different direction, right? And it provides an opening for a more radical reading and interpretation of our information economy. 
Uh, so the, the new frame recognizes that information production and dissemination is influenced by legal and socioeconomic interests. It notes that expert researchers should understand that value may be wielded by powerful interests in ways that marginalize certain voices, but that this value may also be used by individuals and organizations to affect change and for civic, economic, social, or personal gain gains. Um, while the frame implores researchers to understand their rights and responsibilities when participating in information communities, it also recommends that researchers thoughtfully comply with and contest current legal and socioeconomic practices concerning the values of information, right? So it's a lot of words, but essentially what I see this doing is, you know, not everyone is going to read this through a Marxist framework, but I think that provides an opening for us to think about information in a more uh, through rat more radical uh, uh, frames. And I think one of those can be a Marxist frame, right? So why Marx? So Marx uh, is a controversial scholar and malign and very maligned author historically. And in the US in particular, his work was uh, sidelined and blacklisted in the process of the Cold War. Right, and also the followers of Marx and the people who would argue Marxist ideas were also blacklisted in many ways. Right, so we've we've kind of been uh, starved of a Marxist analysis in the U.S. in particular um, uh, during the Cold War and after. Right, but there has been an upsurge in people kind of paying attention to Marx, and I think the one of the origins of that was the economic crash of 2007 to 2009. Um, and uh, that's had a massive impact around the globe. It had an impact on me and my family, but really most, you know, it had a, the greatest impact on people of color and um, black people in the US were hit hardest, uh, gutting the housing market in, in for black families, um, huge loss of, of, of wealth, which is going to have ripple effects, right? Um, and, and this process, you know, so Occupy kind of came out of that. That was one of the major social movements that was sparked by that crash. And, and through that process, some of these major questions about whether or not capitalism is a sufficient economic system, whether it is moral, whether it actually provides materially for most people in society, these questions started being raised. And one of the, the uh, theorists that people would go to to understand those questions would be Marx, right? And that's kind of where I um, uh, started taking Marx more seriously in, in terms of reading and, and trying to understand where he was coming from. So uh, a little bit after that, I started reading um, Marx's Capital and I took, you know, for the nerds out there, um, I, the way I did that was, it's a very long, complex book, but I took David Harvey's class, which is online. Um, he just has a bunch of sort of podcasts or videos that you can go through along with the chat, sets of chapters. So I read, I read that and, and, you know, was very convinced by a lot of the arguments that uh, I, was, I was coming across. And, um, and I started to kind of apply it in my in my daily work. I started to see some of the patterns that Marx was talking about in the way that our capitalist economy, that we interact with our capitalist economy. And so why Marx, right? So I think Marx's description of capitalism, that was his main project, was to describe capitalism so that we can change the system. And I think his description of capitalism helps us understand the problems that I mentioned earlier at least the economic and political dimensions of them. And his tradition helps us think about ways to push back against the abuses of capitalism and help us imagine a new world. And I think we can concretize that within the practice of librarianship. I think it's very, uh, we can apply it within librarianship and I'll get more into that as we go along. So, okay, I'm going to spend a little transition. I'm gonna spend the next 10 minutes or so digging into some broad uh, Marxist concepts, broader concepts, and then the following 10 minutes will be uh, more exploring information economy specific concepts. And then I'll try to um, insert all, uh, different ways to teach and organize around these concepts, right? 
Um, and then I'll conclude with what I think is to be done uh, with this information. Okay. Okay, so starting with what is a commodity? Um, so, commod so Marx's capital starts with uh, what he sees as the most basic um, unit in capitalism, which is a single commodity. And these are things, you know, we have an image over here of, of different commodities, you know, technologies, foods, transportation, all these things that, um, that reproduce daily life, right? And uh, so a commodity for Marx breaks down, uh, it has value, right? Commodities have value. And for, for Marx, the concept of value is fairly complex, but two things to note about it is that they are socially constructed uh, value is socially constructed and in the relationship between these commodities and that it involves labor right so the labor that goes into it creates the value and um, but then beyond that value breaks down into these two concepts for Marx right uh, two sides use value and exchange value and uh, so use value is how useful is the item right how useful is the commodity so if we think about a house, for example, a house provides shelter from the elements. Uh, it's a place to store your things. It's a place to sleep at night. It's a social space, potentially. Um, house provide, it has all these uses, right? Uh, if we think about a textbook, for example, um, textbooks are useful in that they help, you know, develop the hair developmentally appropriate for, you know, if we think of a math textbook for teaching um, calculus and, and then for the, uh, for a faculty member, they might provide test banks and um, and other sorts of materials that uh, that they can use, right? So this this is the use value. And then uh, the second concept, exchange value, right? Uh, exchange value is how much can I get for, uh, how much can I exchange this item for, right? So uh, if we think about a house, um, if you're in the Seattle area, it's absurdly expensive. Right? You know what I'm talking about, folks who are in uh, Seattle or uh, surrounding area. So um, the exchange value, right? How much you can sell the thing for a textbook. Some are worth, you know, $20. Some are worth $320. Um, there's a whole range, right? And um, just in, in, you know, kind of a, an aside, in capitalism, when push comes to shove, although both these things are important for commodities, they're always going to find a use value and an exchange value. Um, when push comes to shove, the exchange value is the uh, dominant uh, concept, right? There's an emphasis on the exchange value over use. Okay, so ownership and exploitation. Uh, within capitalism, this is an oversimplification, but just a starting place, we can think of two classes, two primary classes, um, sort of owners and, and working class, right? So owning class would be, or capitalist class, uh, let's, we can think of like Elsevier, right? The owners of Elsevier, the uh, major investors in Elsevier, um, the um, major stockholders, and, um, and then the, the or, or the owners of a lumber company, right? The lumber company that provides the wood to build the frame house, right? Build the frame of the house or provide other, um, other wood commodities, right? So uh, the owners own the means of production uh, or communication in the, this, the case of Elsevier. Uh, on, the, on the working class side, uh, these are laborers, are working essentially to meet their basic needs. So they are free from uh, the ownership of the means of production uh, and they're also free to sell their labor, but they also, this is how they make their basic uh, needs, or meet their basic needs, eating, getting a house or, or housing, et cetera, right? Um, and the profit, right? The thing that, uh, that keeps capitalism going, the profit, is produced by uh, this class, right, in their labor. And this is why, you know, just in a, an aside, this is why strikes are so powerful, because they, when people stop, when they withhold their labor, that stops the system of production, that stops the ability 
for um, capitalist enterprises to function and make profit. Okay, so um, exploitation has, um, I do want to note, it's really important to think about this uh, capitalism and exploitation as being gendered and racialized. And two theorists that I'll throw out there, first, um, Cedric Robinson, who wrote a really uh, important book called Black Marxism makes a really compelling argument for um, capital capitalism having always been uh, racialized, right? From the very beginning, um, there was racial differentiation that was used in the process, right? And, and the same for gender. Um, Sylvia Federici is a really excellent thinker around, around that. Um, around those arguments. And so the primary manifestations of racial and gender differentiation in capitalism are the production of racist and sexist ideologies, uh, differentiated work arrangements across racial and gender identities, and disparities in the flow of material resources. The money goes to certain people and it doesn't go to other folks. Um, and so there's varying degrees of exploitation. Um, so capitalists uh, exploit these differentiations and hierarchies in order to drive wages down and control workers as well. It's another important part of it. Okay. So commodity fetish. This is the last broad Marxist concept that I'll share. And the commodity fetish is about hidden relationships. So when we think about a, a, a house or a textbook, right, we don't see the hierarchies in power that went into creating that actual commodity, right? We're not able to see it. All we see is in the marketplace, we purchased this book, we purchased the, the house, all the, the production process is not made visible. And um, so we don't know in the, in the case of the book, how much the author uh, was paid, how, uh, what their working conditions were like. Uh, we don't know how much profit the, the um, the owner of the company is making, right? So all that's kind of hidden. And so then we think about what, what gets confused in that process is where does profit come from? And there's this debate between, historical debate between um, sort of capitalist economists and, and the Marxist tradition, which is like, where, where is this profit coming from? Where is surplus value coming from? Um, sort of capitalist economists would say that it comes in the exchange process, right? So it's the act of exchanging these things that produces this magical profit. Um, Marx, on the other hand, argues very convincingly that the profit comes from uh, the workers, right? And uh, has a very, you know, uh, extensive argument for how, in, sh in showing how um, labor is what creates value, surplus value in particular. Um, okay, so that is the broad concepts. And so as a little transition into thinking about the um, sort of information specific components of, of capitalism, uh, I'm just going to go through the cycle of an information economy real quick. So and we'll use a, a, a scholarly journal article as an example. Um, so Let's take this hypothetical, I'm starting on the left side here, scholar employed by a public university in the US, right? And they decide that they want to uh, share their research findings. They've been doing exciting research, they wanna share them. So they write up an article and they forward it over to a top journal, right? Uh, the editor at this journal organizes the peer review process. Uh, they, they decide that they want uh, they're interested in the article, they want it to be reviewed, they send it over to the reviewers, those reviewers provide comments, send it back to the editor, the editor organizes that, sends it back to the, uh, the scholar. This is very familiar probably to most of us who um, have uh, been around this process many times, either participating in it or, or as librarians, right? And um, so the so the scholar will say makes the, the required adjustments, uh, re resubmits it to the editor, and the editor decides to accept the, and move forward with publishing this article. Uh, 
so in that in that time the the this journal in particular happens to be owned by Elsevier and Elsevier provides uh, some really great copy editing uh, for this particular journal and then and then Elsevier is now set to um, distribute this this journal right or this article and so if it's part of if you have institutional access you can access this journal right and and if it's a part of a package that's sold through a database or if you're not if you don't have institutional access you might be an individual scholar that's not in school or a part of a, an institution um, you might encounter this online you know being sold uh, for about $35 or something like that per download um, so that's how Elsevier makes money off of it they they um, they don't pay the scholar for their work. We know that, right? Generally, um, but the scholar does get credit, and you know they're not getting nothing from it. They're getting credit. They might get credit towards tenure. Uh, they might get the satisfaction of um, of sharing their ideas widely and and kind of furthering a conversation. Get, getting to keep their job. All these things. Um, so some scholars might be okay with this arrangement, but I think there's a growing number of people who are not okay with this, especially the paywall component of it, right? If you are producing uh, arguments and, and ideas and you want to further a conversation, it's, it's um, not helpful to your project if the ideas are behind a paywall, right? So, so there's a growing number of people who are not happy with this. Um, and, and so just quickly, how did we get to a scenario in which um, in which we're kind of gifting these profits to major companies. So just a real quick review on that. So about 70 years ago, journal markets uh, had more competition and prices were much lower. But over time, individual journal titles were unique enough that they could continue charging more and more. And, lead, and this led to a crisis in the journal uh, prices about 30 years ago. And uh, major publishers like Elsevier stepped in to offer a way out of this crisis. And uh, those were digital, large digital access uh, packages, right? So libraries took the bait on that offer and they never actually saw the promised savings. Um, instead, publishers increased prices continuously and made out like capitalist bandits while uh, their power snowballed, right? So they built this power in the market uh, and, and they've really wielded that to um, kind of bully us quite a bit, right? And this is a process we'll see regularly in uh, information markets, capitalist information markets. Okay, so moving into some information specific uh, capitalist concepts. Um, so there's a few things that are that are different about information uh, commodities, right? So first of all, they're not they're what's called non-rivalrous. They are um, and they, because they can be used simultaneously. So non-rivalrous means like someone could be reading the same information at the same time. And uh, they're also produced very cheaply, right? So it's almost nothing to, to reproduce an article. It's just copyable on the web in particular, right? And, uh, and they contain ideas that are, you know, arguably social, right? No, you know, you can't trace one idea to one person. The ideas are social, language is social. So there's a good debate around uh, whether or not you can associate it with an individual, right? Um, so, Another major issue and concept is, is um, in the commodification of information is this tendency towards uh, con what we call concentration or monopolies and oligopolies. So concentration in the marketplace. And this happens across a wide range of information uh, markets, uh, including media, textbooks, and, and journal and scholarly journal articles, right? So I'll just go through some of the information. This is a, a chart of um, US media industry and sort of the, the ownership structure. 
uh, I think this is really common knowledge that, you know, very few companies own the, the vast majority of our uh, media in the US. And one of the interesting notions of right now, right? So uh, I read a, a book recently by Matt Taibbi called uh, Hate Inc. I don't always agree with everything he says, but I really enjoyed this book. And, you know, he, he's one of the things he mentions is that media, the trust in media is currently at an all time low which is scary because we're dealing with those major problems, right? But they're also at a, a point where their uh, profits are at an all-time high. So um, it's a <laughs> that's a really weird contradiction and there's definitely a political, economic, an economic dimension of that. Um, so one of the ways, speaking of uh, teaching this concept, one of the ways that I like doing this is um, sharing this video of, of the Sinclair Group, uh, which owns a lot of the local TV news stations, like a really large a, a number of them. And this, this video basically uh, shows the ways that concentration can impact the, the news that gets delivered. So it's, you know, maybe 20, 30 different stations saying the exact same thing, but it's also uh, hypocritical in that they're, they're critiquing sort of control and, and, um, and uh, spreading falsehoods in, in media. So it's a really uh, great teaching tool, getting students thinking about, oh, who owns media and, and, and um, how do we talk about it? So this is a Sinclair group. Just an interesting quick story is when, when last summer when I was um, writing up my first draft of this article, I went over to an island near Seattle just to do a little writing retreat. Uh, and uh, it's called Bashan. And I went to the beach one day to read and uh, found this sign, right? And the sign, uh, KVI Beach is privately owned by Sinclair Radio of Seattle, which I just thought was, I can't get away from um, Sinclair Group, right? They, they own everything. They own the beach that I'm on. You know, graciously, they let me use it, though, for the day. Um, okay, textbooks. So textbooks also have a lot of concentration of ownership. 80% of total textbook sales in 2016 went to five companies. The top three companies are currently Pearson, Cengage, and McGraw-Hill. Um, and, and, you know, recently, Cengage and McGraw-Hill were trying to, um, to consolidate, uh, to combine their companies, and merge is the right word I'm looking for. And uh, that would have been over 50% of the, the total market. That was rejected uh, recently by... Uh, the Justice Department, which is one positive thing coming out of that. Um, so textbooks, you know, and, and this is another issue that is very interesting to students as they deal with really high textbook costs, uh, annoyance with textbook content, lots of um, great ways to talk about this with students. Um, and then just lastly, in journal publishing, um, the percentage of publications uh, published by the top five publishers increased dramatically over the last 30 years in the social sciences. For example, the top five publishers published 10% of psychology publications in 1953, and that number steadily grew to over 70% in 2014. All right, so, um, and they made, you know, Journal publishers make t massive money, as I mentioned earlier, $4 billion in profit 2018, 31%. So why, why do um, these markets tend to consolidate and become oligopolies and, and monopolies? Um, so one, some of the vulnerable, well, Marx argued that markets in general have a tendency towards monopoly and oligopoly, but uh, information markets are, are have some vulnerabilities that are unique. Um, one of them being if a company gets a foothold in the market, um, that means they have the attention of people. They can further direct use viewers and users attention back to their products, right? So they can use that attention to continue to build their, their market. You know, you might watch the news and then they, they hand off to the next person in the news or they, um, you know, on a news station, they might, uh, um, advertise during their advertising time some uh, additional programs that um, 
the company offers, right? So that's an example. Uh, also, since information is kind of socially developed and easily shared, um, so in order to commodify, there's, it's difficult to commodify information because since it's so easily sh shared, um, you have to create these pretty strict barriers, you know, paywalls, et cetera, in order to, uh, to sell it and make a profit off of it. And then once you kind of create a really strong barrier, you can charge all sorts of ridiculous amounts of money, $35 for a single article, right? Um, so those are some of the vulnerabilities that we see. And, you know, there's just major problems with this kind of concentration. And this is stuff that's really fun to talk about with students. Fun might not be the appropriate word, but like interesting. Um, so again, they get to control the prices when you have a monopoly and oligopoly, right? Um, they can control the ideas, a really important thing for students, right? When they're dealing with so many problems, right? Police violence, right? When, when, when media concentration is controlling the ideas around that, you're not getting the uh, Overton window can be really small. Um, and this is, these are, these are coming from a, the scholar Christian Fuchs, who um, is in this tradition of sort of Marxist communication scholars, something I forgot to mention that um, there's a whole set of scholarship building off of Marx and other political economists that is very important uh, in this conversation. Um, political power, right? Money equals power in our, in our democracy. So they get political power. Uh, and then they're able to surveil and, um, and censor people. Also a scary component of, of that concentration. Um, all right, I'm running short on time. I'm noticing that. So I'm going to just start running through this stuff. And again, you know, check out that article uh, in Lead Pipe um, if you want to uh, find more information on this. So, okay, information labor. This was one of the m more fun activities that I did with students. Um, and so kind of looking at various forms of information labor. But okay, so paid, there's paid labor and that's kind of a uh, more of a traditional industrial relationship um, for those laborers, right? So those are folks who uh, are employed, they do work, they get paid for it in some way, right? Um, those might be uh, tech workers, they might be um, editors for a journal, they might be, you know, I think librarians are information workers, um, you know, coal tan miners who are so uh, important to the process of technology. Um, and then there's also this unpaid prosumer labor. So the, uh, uh, an example of that would be um, uh, Facebook users who are not paid to use Facebook, but they produce information for Facebook, they produce um, posts, share photos um, that everyone enjoys and, and, and consumes. Um, so they both uh, are consuming and producing. Those are generally unpaid uh, relationships, right? And, um, and race and gender, again, are really important components here. Gender theorists have um, really theorized that unpaid prosumer labor piece and connected it to uh, the ways that um, sort of reproductive labor has happened historically, uh, particularly by women. Uh, going unpaid, right? Um, and and then I think race is a really an important dimension of this. Uh, <clears throat> so again, one of the ways that I, I've taught this is uh, sharing articles with students across all of these, uh, a bunch of different information worker job classes or job groups um, and, and have them kind of read and, and understand and try to understand what they do, some of the problems, some of the benefits associated with them. I've always tried to include um, things that folks in the US probably won't think about. So there's um, the work, uh, uh, so the, the um, in the Philippines, there's a significant sector of folks who are doing kind of culling through, um, um, mod they're moderating uh, social media and and kind of looking through all this sort of nasty stuff and getting rid of it right and and it's really brutal psychologically harmful work there's also coltan miners and other key mineral miners around the world in the global south africa 
Chile, um, all sorts of places that are being super exploited through the process. Uh, but are, you know, what they're producing is very much needed for technology and information to circulate. So I want students to see that type of labor and connect with that type of labor that's happening and think about, you know, how can we be in solidarity with people across, um, across these job sectors? Okay, lastly, surveillance and security. Um, really important, I think students uh, are generally pretty scared about uh, surveillance, not everybody, but so I, I talk about surveillance, you know, uh, this notion of surveillance capitalism. I show them a video of, um, uh, I'm forgetting her name off the top of my mind, but Zuboff is her last name. Um, her book, show her an interview of her book, um, where she's talking about her book, Surveillance Capitalism. And we talk about this notion of imminent commodification, which comes from the scholar uh, Vincent Mosco, where he talks about imminent commodification being um, uh, information markets need more information about their users in order to sell advertising. So, you know, this, we can think of newspapers, they sell advertising, that's one of the major ways that they make money. Um, historically, they've had to know more and more about their readers because they want to get the right ads to them and the ads that will, you know, influence them the most. So there's this internal need to, to gain information. And, and from that sort of structure, we've seen this growing of a surveillance apparatus within our information economy. And it's really quite uh, out of hand right now. And we, you know, we also can see this in library databases. Sarah Lambden wrote a great article in, um, uh, in the library with the lead pipe recently, um, you know, talking about the ways that library databases are collaborating with ICE to uh, share user information, like really scary. Um, the uh, a note about sharing this with students, I think it's really important to um, give them some uh, way to think about security within this. So I share a page um, that uh, Reed Garber Pearson created at, at UW where, uh, you know, listing a bunch of ways to be secure online. Okay, so let me wrap up here and do some conclusions and how to go forward, how to teach this stuff, really bring it down. So Obviously, I'm arguing, arguing that we should be teaching um, Marxist information literacy. Um, so I personally, uh, oh, so we should teach about three things, commodification and concentration, um, information, labor, and surveillance. Those are kind of the three main concepts that I think we could be talking about in the classroom um, based on our, our information as value frame. And, um, I do this in both one credit classes and full credit classes. I think the full credit or the, the sorry, one credit, uh, uh, one shot classes and, and full in credit classes because um, in credit classes, we can really dive into this information more uh, in depth. And I'm, plan I'm teaching a class this fall. We're gonna really get into all of these concepts in, in uh, one shot classes. I will really just tailor it to whatever the needs of that particular class are. Um, so, and I think the key thing here is to help students see the structures behind their experience with information systems. So why do they have the experience that they're having, right? So helping them build a sense of the structure is so key. What, what are the components of capitalism what are the patterns of capitalism that keep popping up? Um, so, so what to do as we go forward, um, teach this stuff, teach it in the classroom, take it outside of the classroom. I think there's a way that we can be outside of the classroom, you know, for example, teaching this stuff in committees, teaching um, this with students doing OE projects, right? Um, we can be sharing this information out uh, in, in many different formats. And, um, and then lastly, I think organize, right? Organizing is the key, is the other component of the Marxist tradition that we really need to keep in mind. And that, in particular, labor organizing, 
there's lots of uh, there's lots of traditions of organizing, but labor organizing in which uh, we have so much power, right? It feels so powerless that we just keep getting bullied, for example, by the, the um, major companies, major vendors. But we have a lot of power, right? And, and when we get together, we can wield that power. So I think some things that we can organize around, not, you know, our labor conditions and libraries, um, you know, we, we have very precarious uh, work conditions, you know, there's more and more adjuncts. Um, there's more, you know, we're, we're kind of pushed to go back to work in COVID times. Uh, so labor organizing, and then we can also organize around information issues, you know, promoting alternative media, excuse me, um, promoting open education and uh, OER, promoting um, open access, right? Organizing so that uh, we can get the, get our information sources from out behind um, paywalls. Um, yeah, so I think I will close there and open it up for questions. That was a lot of talking and um, I wanna give you all a minute here to just ask clarifying questions and um, yeah, let's, let's start there.